you so much, Sonia. Let me give you a word. I want you to think about what it means. It's, it's not a small word, but perfunctory. Perfunctory. What, is it, what, what does that mean? You, you may be able to rattle off a definition. You may say, well, I'm kind of, I don't know exactly, I've heard that word before. I don't know exactly what it means. So let me see if I can define it for you uh, without giving you a formal definition. All right, so here's what perfunctory looks like. You ever been to a uh, fast food restaurant and what you get looks very different than the picture on the sign? Let me give you an example. Um, it's been a while since I have been to a Wendy's, but uh, over the years I have ordered a number of Junior Bacon Cheeseburgers. It's a really good deal. I don't know what it's up to now. It used to be it was a dollar. I don't know the way things are going now. It's probably 18. But anyway, the Junior Bacon Cheeseburger, you see it and it's got, you've got a bun with, <coughs> excuse me, you've got mayonnaise and the, the hamburger patty, lettuce, tomato, uh, I think there's onion on it, or, or there's bacon, there's bacon. And um, anyway, the picture looks good. It looks like a great deal. But I have ordered that, and then what I get doesn't look anything at all like the picture that I saw on the menu board. In fact, uh, as I open it, I see it does have two pieces of bacon, but the pieces of bacon are stacked on top of each other going across the patty. So that there's just like a, a bacon, it's like my hamburger has a bacon mohawk, all right? And then there's the tomato, especially if you order it in the wintertime, but even then that's that's not always the case. It can be in the heart of summer. But you'll get a tomato that looks like it's cut from the very end of what was only um, genetically identified as a tomato because it is completely white. And it's mostly just stem. Have you seen something like that? I mean, it's, and it is so hard. It is so flavorless. And it's about the size of a large quarter. And it's, it's on there. As if that were not enough, that, I mean, you've, you've got the bun, but it looks like the employee might have either accidentally or intentionally sat on it before they gave it to you. I guess that's the new panini. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so, so you get this, and there is this, this notion that you have. You know, I, I'd like to take this back and say, no, I, th this is not right. I'd like to complain. But then you, you realize that there's no use in doing that because technically the employee did what they should do, which is it's supposed to have two pieces of bacon. It does. It's supposed to have tomato on it. It does. It's supposed to have a bun, and it does. But how they have put this all together, there is no pride, there is no attempt at operating with excellence, there is just this whole experience of going through the motions. That is perfunctory. Here's another example. I remember uh, when I was uh, in Charlotte, I was driving home, this is my first house, and it was in the wintertime, and we'd had some sort of bad weather where they had uh, brought around salt and slag trucks. And so once the whatever bad precipitation we have had has come and gone, still you had in the center of the road and on the edges, you had all that salt and slag that had just kind of gathered. We'd not had enough rain to be able to wash that away. And so on this particular day, the DMV has sent their employee out to paint lines. And so I get behind this truck that is painting lines on the right side, and he is pouring down all that paint on what? On salt and slag. And I thought, are you kidding me? I mean, this is an absolute waste because as soon as it rains, what's going to happen? Bye-bye line. Why? Because the employee is painting the salt and the slag. What was he doing? He was doing his job, technically, wasn't he? But it was perfunctory. He was just going through the motions. Now, regularly we see and experience that type of thing. Sometimes we can even find ourselves going, or getting caught in that trap as well in a whole variety of different ways where we are technically doing what you might say we are supposed to be doing when in reality we're just kind of operating as though I'm just trying to get my ticket punched. I'm going through the motions. There is no heartfelt intent. There is no real desire. There's no passion. I'm just going through the motions. It is perfunctory. Now let me ask you this, in terms of you and your relationship with God, how many of you would, would say, man, I would love to have a perfunctory relationship with God? I mean, I want to walk with God where I can say with a big beaming smile, I am, so, I am so glad that Jesus loves me, I am so happy to be in a relationship with God where I am just going through the motions. You, you, you would say that you don't want that. We would collectively say that we don't want that. Unfortunately, too many times, that's exactly what we experience. 
technically we may be doing some right and some good and some positive things, but what we are doing is just a purely perfunctory exercise. It is simply going through the motions. We can be doing that in our relationship with God. And we're going to be thinking about that today as the first in a new series that we're calling Bad Religion, when good Christianity goes bad. And specifically the question we're thinking about today is this. How do I know or how can I know if the walk with God that I have is one where I'm simply going through the motions? We see the answer to that question in the little book of Amos. If you would look with me in your Bibles there today, Amos chapter 5, and we're going to stop, start, excuse me, we're going to start with verse 21. Amos chapter 5. I realize that we had been uh, in Habakkuk for a few weeks uh, in, in the Minor Prophets, and we're, we're soon going to be out of them. But today we're going to be in the book of Amos, Amos chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Pay attention to what God says through Amos to his people. So this is God talking. I hate, I despise your feasts. I can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will have no regard for your fellowship offerings or fattened cattle. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But, or instead, let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. House of Israel, was it sacrifices and grain offerings that you presented to me during the 40 years in the wilderness? But you have taken up Saku, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god, images you've made for yourselves. So I will send you into exile beyond Damascus. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name. He has spoken. You may read that and you say, well, I don't really know what that has to do with me. And it's using some words, using some names that uh, I don't know, I've never heard before. I've heard of Taiwan, I've never heard of Kaiwan, and so I don't know if this has a lot to do or anything to do with me, but I believe the truth is it has a great deal to do with you, has a great deal to do with me in terms of answering this question. As a person that is in relationship with God, how can I tell if the walk, the relationship I have with Him, is just going through the motions? And based on what we see God saying to His people through Amos, the first way we can tell is this. You are going through the motions if you have, if I have a compartmentalized walk with God. I have a compartmentalized walk with God. What does that mean? Hopefully it will make more sense here in just a moment. Amos comes to us, obviously, uh, near the end of the Old Testament. It's one of several small books of the Bible that are part of what we know as the minor prophets. Minor only because they're not very long, and Amos is not a very long book at all. And Amos, uh, the, the, in terms of context, the stuff that you need to know that helps inform what we're thinking about here is this. Amos is a prophet of God. He's a contemporary of, of people like Isaiah. He's a guy who is from the southern kingdom, which is Judah, but God uses him to speak to the people of God in the north that are in Israel. And so as he is using Amos to speak to them, there were things that he wanted them to hear. That's what the prophet's task was, to operate as a mouthpiece for God, to, to communicate to them uh, what it is that God wanted them to hear. And what they needed to hear was this, things are going really, really bad. You are the people of God, but you don't act like it. You don't look like it at all. And you are living consistently as if I don't exist. You're just doing everything according to what you think, what you think is right, how you feel. You're operating as though it's Burger King and you can have everything your way. You don't even look like the people of God. And I'm sending these prophets to warn you, to challenge you, to encourage you, to confront you, to say, this needs to change. And if it doesn't, there's going to be some disciplinary action that I'm going to use to try to get your attention and draw you back into closeness, back into meaningful relationship with me. And so Amos is one of the guys that God uses to share that type of message. And as he is writing to them, uh, he he gets to this point, God is speaking through Amos, and he says to his people, so these are, are people that know, have a relationship with God, these are the people of God, and God says this, I hate your feasts, your solemn assemblies, your offerings, the noise of your songs, the music of your harps, all that stuff. What's God saying? 
All of it stinks. All, all, all of this is lousy. And so when, when he's talking about feasts, he's talking about special observances. And it's likely you're aware that the Jewish calendar had a whole slew of different special observances, oftentimes called feasts, where they were going to be celebrating things that God had done in the past. For example, there was the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, the Passover was also a feast celebrating what God has done in the past. And so God is saying to his people, you are observing these special days. You're celebrating these feasts. Now, when he talks about solemn assemblies, he's talking about the gathering of the people of God for corporate worship. Something not at all unfamiliar or too far distant from what we are doing today. You are gathering together. The temple is still in existence. People are gathering for worship. You're gathering together for these solemn assemblies. You are giving offerings. And you're likely aware in the Old Testament there were a whole slew of different offerings that the people of God were supposed to give. And Amos talks about, or God through Amos talks about several of them. Burnt offerings and grain offerings and then even sacrifice offerings through fellowship offerings with a fattened calf. And so he's saying you're doing that and then he talks about your songs, and so he's saying, you're gathering together, you're gathering at the temple, and you sing, so there's vocal music, and then he talks about music from the harps, so there's instrumental music. So all this stuff is going on. And again, very easily you could say, what does this have to do with me? Well, let's, let's personalize it. The people of God were gathering together for corporate worship, they were giving offerings, they were singing songs. They were playing instruments. You done any of that stuff lately? Well, we, we just caught each other doing that right now. They were doing this, but what does God say about it? He says, Are you, you gather together for these special dates, these special occasions to celebrate what I've done. Whether it's the Passover for us, it's celebrating the incarnation of Christmas. You, you celebrate that, but God says, how do I feel about it? He says, I hate it. Not, eh, I'm just kind of iffy. I hate it. I hate what you're doing. And he says, with regard to your, your solemn assemblies, as you gather together for worship, this ought to come to me and come up to me as a pleasant fragrance. But I'm telling you, it stinks. It's like a skunk walked in. That's how I view what it's like when you worship together. And your, your offerings that you give to me, he says, I'm not going to accept them. So, so you were doing all this stuff, you're giving these offerings, whether it's grain, whether it's coins, whether it's a sacrifice by virtue of an animal, and I'm not interested, I'm not pleased, and I'm not accepting one solitary bit of that. And with regard to your music, whether it's singing or whether it's an instrument that's being played, I don't care if it's the best musician and the best vocalist among you, do you know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like noise. God's not happy. Why is that? What's the problem? Because aren't they, they're doing right things, aren't they? They're going to the temple. They're offering offerings. They're singing. They are playing instruments. They are giving, uh, they're, they're, and they're, uh, they're celebrating special days, celebrating what God has done. They're doing all of these things, and how does God feel about it? Big fat thumbs down. He's not interested at all, and why is that? He says in verse 24, Let justice flow like water, and righteousness like an unfailing stream. So he's saying, you are doing all of these things, but the problem is this. With respect to how you are treating others, there's a complete absence of justice. With, re with respect to personal behavior, there's an absolute vacancy of righteous behavior and right living. You say, well, what exactly is going on? If you were to go back, to, uh, if, if you were to go back uh, earlier in the book of Amos, back to chapter 2, starting in verse 6, you don't have to turn there, but just listen to this. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Israel for the crimes, three crimes, even four, because, he says, they sell a righteous person for silver and a needy person for a pair of sandals. So you're selling people into slavery just so you can have a more comfortable life. Good people, even, upstanding people. That you have no value for other persons. He says, you trample on the heads of the poor, on the dust of the ground, obstruct the path of the needy. You've got people in real need, real need around you, but you don't care. You're like, get out of my way. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get my new hamburger. Get, get, get away from me. Completely ignoring all of that, ignoring the needs of people. And then he says, a man and his father have sexual relations with the same girl. What? So, with respect to how they are treating each other, it's terrible. With respect to personal morality, Godly moral standards, they're completely out of bounds. So their lives are a wreck, but what? 
Come Sabbath day, what's going on? Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Oh, let, oh man, let's stand and sing Amazing Grace. Let's bow our heads at the right time. Let's put some money in the offering plate. Let's do all of these things. But then when we leave that presence, life is going to look very, very different. What I'm trying to say is that they were compartmentalizing God. And they were saying essentially this, God will give you a little bit of time on our Sabbath day. And the stuff that you said to do, because listen, they weren't doing these things because they dreamt them up. They're doing them because God said you're supposed to do them. So we will do that stuff. However, as soon as we are done, life is going to look very, very different. So we give you this little bit, but the rest of the day, the rest of the week, that's all mine, and I'm going to operate however it is that I want. So we compartmentalize God. They compartmentalize God. They just put him in a box, a box that they take down on a regular basis, take the lid off, and as soon as they've done whatever they can do to get their ticket punched, then they put God back in the box, put him back on the shelf so they can do their own thing. Now, does that sound familiar? Unfortunately, too many times it does. You say, well, how is that? Let me illustrate it even this way. I have been in church my entire life. I mean, honestly, from the earliest months of life in this world, my parents uh, made sure that the, the experience at church and active church life has been an essential part of my life my entire life. And so that being said, I can't tell you over the years, I've heard something like this happen time and time and time again. Typically, it happens either just before or right after a worship service. And it'll happen in a room like this. It'll happen in the sanctuary. And so people afterwards, so there's, I mean, nobody's paying a whole lot of attention, but you'll have some folks that are in conversation with each other. And somebody will say something, and in response to that, someone else will say, I can't believe you said that in the church. The least you should do is wait till you get to the parking lot. Have you ever heard that? If somebody told you that, you've been a bad... <laughs> no, but, but sincerely, we have, we have heard that. Maybe you have even said that. And oftentimes it's said in jest, but isn't there an important truth behind that? I think sincerely there is, which is that many times what we do is that we operate in a perfunctory fashion, that my relationship with God is one, and my walk with Him that is one where He's in a box. And so I'll give him 10.30 to 11.30 on Sunday mornings. And I'll stand up at the right time. I'll bow my head in prayer. I will put some money in the offering plate. I'll help people uh, maybe pass out a bulletin. Or uh, I'll help open a door for someone. I'll teach a Sunday school class. Or I'll sit in a Sunday school class. I'll give you these things that are good, that they are positive. But when I leave this place, how I look on Monday looks very different than how I look on Sunday morning at 10.30. The conversations that I have in the break room look very, very different than the conversations I have before Sunday school. The way it is that I deal with people and the ethics that I practice as an employee, that I practice as a student, look very, very different than how I'm answering questions as part of a Sunday school class. And what I'm saying is that's a problem. It's a problem for me, it's a problem for you, it's a problem for all of us because... What it means is this, if you are doing the right thing just right now, and if your life is one where your walk with God is where you, you come on Sundays because it's your regular habit and routine, and you pat yourself on the back thinking, I've kind of got my ticket punched, and God's okay with me because I'm giving Him Sunday mornings, if Thursday afternoon and Friday night, and if Tuesday at lunch looks completely different, I'm suggesting to you that it's likely you have compartmentalized God. And he's just kind of operating in a box. And if God is just operating in a box, it doesn't make any difference how good the stuff that you are doing right now at this moment is. I'm telling you, God's not happy. God's not pleased. In effect, all this stuff that you're doing is for naught. I don't want, hopefully you don't want to have a relationship with God that's just going through the motions. One of the ways that you can identify that's the case, is this. Have I compartmentalized God? Does the Michael of Sunday morning at 1030 look altogether different from the Michael of Tuesday afternoon? Does the person that you see in the mirror on a Friday night look very, very different than the person who looked in the mirror just before you walked in this room? If that's the case, I'm telling you, there's a real problem. And your walk with God 
It's just going through the motions. There's another way that you can tell based on what God used Amos to say here, and that's this. I have made what I most treasure. I have made what I most treasure. Back in verse 26, God says to them, You have, you have taken up Sakuth and your, as your king and Kaiwan your star god. So who, th- th- you may have never heard these names before. One of them... Uh, the, the, excuse me, the, the first is an Assyrian war god, and the other was a uh, god of the stars, sometimes known as Saturn. And he's saying that, that that's what you have made effectively as your god. But I, I don't want you to get stuck in the names or in the specifics of that. But uh, just step back and pay attention to broadly what's going on. You have those that are the people of God. Can you identify with that? I hope. I hope that you have a personal relationship with Christ so that you could say, I'm part of the group that is the people, part of the followers of God. And they are doing some good things. They are gathering for corporate worship. They are singing. They are playing instruments. They are giving. They are rendering sacrifice. They are doing all of these things. As a person, a follower of God, hopefully you are doing some of those. In fact, even by being here today, you're doing some of those very positive, positive things. And even though they were doing that, even though there was much religious experience and religious behavior that was going on, everything that they were doing at the temple, everything that was occurring in the synagogue, it was going through the motions. Because God is saying, what what really mattered to you, where the real worship was going on, was to these others, to Kaiwan and Sakuth. But notice the statement. He says, images, what? you have made for yourselves. Images you have made for yourselves. Now, in in this case, we're talking about specific, overt, blatant, flagrant idolatry, where there are likely images, little statues, big statues that have been made to identify these particular gods that they are supposedly worshiping or that they are actually worshiping. And it's easy to say, well, Michael, I'm not doing that. I don't have any statue in my home. I don't have some little ornament in my car that I'm like, you know, before I uh, turn the keys that I I, I just offer uh, incense to and that I'm just gathering in a kneeled position before. I'm I'm not doing that type of thing. So what does this have to do with me? Again, pay attention to that statement where he says, images are things that you have made for yourselves. Something that you have effectively crafted. And so, worship is going on. All right, Worship is going on in the temple. But all of that's perfunctory. It's going through the motions. But sincerity was found. The expressions of ultimate value and worth are ascribed to the stuff that they have made. They were expressing greater worth on what they had made instead of a great God who had been revealed. Now again, it's easy to gloss over this and say, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't do. I'm not doing something like that. I haven't made anything. But it's entirely possible that that's not the case. Maybe it is that that you, you have. If I could broaden it out just a little bit to help you see it, to say this. What they are putting ultimate value on is what they had made. And I think that's when we tend and where we tend to get into trouble. Something that we have made, or even more generally, something that just involves us becomes what we place greatest and most significant value on. Sometimes that can be a person. In in the life of a teenager, even an adult, it can happen where you make a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You've made this person your, your, your significant other, and they are of greatest of value to you. Where everything else is secondary. We can do that with our children, even. We can elevate them. To, and it's not to suggest that, that relationships with other people and relationships with our children should be of, of no consequence. I'm not saying that at all. But we can elevate them to the place where what we have made, that, that they, they get elevated to the position in the place of greatest prominence, of ultimate value. We can do that with athletics. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I have watched time and time and time again where sport gets elevated and becomes a trump card for anything related to God. It can happen with hobbies. It can happen with all sorts of things where what involves me, revolves around me, that is what I am demonstrating through my actions and ultimately through my affections what matters most and is of greatest consequence 
to me. The people of God did it then, and unfortunately it happens even today, where what has been offered and what has been given is of less value than what we have made and what we have focused on. Let me illustrate it this way, and before I do that, let me just say I'm getting ready to say something that may very well offend you. In just a few moments, we're going to be leaving, and probably the next item on your agenda list is to have lunch. And it is likely that more than a couple of you will be having fried chicken today. I love fried chicken. I love fried chicken indeed. It is truly one of my favorite foods, and I really, really love it. Among those that love fried chicken, among those of you that are going to have fried chicken today, uh, that fried chicken could come from a varied number of places. There's, of course, KFC. I don't know if church is still around. There's Popeye's, there's, uh, there's Bojangles, there's Smithfields, there's even Lowe's Foods or Publix. You can buy it at Harris Teeter. All these places that you may buy fried chicken. It's also possible, though, that you don't get fried chicken from any of those places, but you go home and you make fried chicken. Here's where you may get offended. Whatever fried chicken you make today, I'm promising you, it's not as good as the chicken that can be bought. I'm just telling you. You may think that your homemade chicken, chicken that you have made, that you have double dredged, it was mama's recipe. It was grandma's recipe. All I'm saying is, Colonel Sanders' recipe is better. <laughs> On what basis do I say that? How many people have asked you to open a chicken restaurant? <laughs> How many people are going to wait in line to get your fried chicken? What I'm saying is this. That which is being offered is better significantly superior than that which has been made. Now, I say that in jest to communicate this thought. That which has been offered, which is this, that the God who made everything, who upholds everything by His power, the one who speaks things into existence has made it possible for me to have a real and meaningful relationship with Him. He has made it possible for me to be forgiven of all the ways in which I have acted out of bounds. He has done all that, and He has made that possible. And regardless of whatever it is that I have made, whether it's my job, whether it's my family, whether it's my sports, whether it's my hobbies, whether it's my music, regardless of any of the things that I have made, and even though those things can be significant and they can be important, what I'm saying is that... Having the relationship with the one who made you, that is vastly superior to any and everything that you could ever, ever come up with and make. And what can happen for me, for you, as a follower of Christ, we can get into a trap where what we treasure and what we value most, as evidenced by how we spend our time, as evidenced by how we spend our money, as evidenced by what captivates our attention, is what we have made, what revolves around us, rather than the one who made everything and has made it possible to know him in a real and a meaningful way. The people of God in Amos' day fell into that trap. And because of that, they had a relationship with God, but it was absolutely perfunctory. They were going through the motions. And you say, well, well Michael, I, I appreciate the explanation. Thank you for that. Uh, but what, at the end of the day, does this have to do with me? And of what consequence is this? I'll tell you why I'm sharing this today and why this is of consequence. Because when we are engaged in perfunctory relationship, going through the motions type of relationship with God, whatever it is that we're doing is of no benefit. Pay attention to the text. They were doing some positive things, weren't they? They were gathering for worship. They were celebrating these feasts. They were having and giving offerings. They were singing songs. They were playing instruments. They were doing all of those things. Were they any better for it? 
Was God even remotely pleased? God says, I hate it. Instead of a fragrant offering, this is like a horrible stench, like a skunk walked in the room. This is terrible. You're wasting your time. Listen to me. A relationship with God where you're going through the motions is a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of thought. It's a waste of everything. But a relationship with God that is real, that's not going through the motions, that's engaged, when He really does have the place of prominence, when He is what you value most, when He is not just a thought on a Sunday morning at 1030, but when He saturates how it is that you operate on a Monday afternoon and on a Friday evening and a Thursday morning and a, a, a Tuesday afternoon, when that's the case, and you have a real and meaningful relationship with God, that's the relationship that can change any and everything. That's the type of relationship that God is pleased by. The question I ask for you, or have for you very simply this morning, is this. What type of relationship do you have with God? Real and meaningful, or going through the motions? Can you bow your heads with me?